Well, let's together turn in the Word of God to Genesis chapter 44. Genesis 44, verses 18 through the end of the chapter. We're continuing our series through the book of Genesis and come now to Genesis 44, verse 18. The brothers are now standing before Joseph. And Joseph wants to keep Benjamin with him and send all the other brothers home uh, because it was in Benjamin's sack that that silver cup was found. And, uh, and now we have Judah speaking. Verse 18, hear the word of God. Then Judah went up to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we, we have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. And then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The, the boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, the, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, go again, buy us a little food, we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me. And I said, surely he has been torn in pieces. And I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs in evil to Sheol. Now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord. And let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Well, let's pray together. O oh, Lord in heaven, we thank you for your word and for this passage of scripture. We thank you, Lord, for this speech of, of Judah to his his, at this point, unknown brother, Joseph. And Lord, we pray that it would be instructive to us this morning and that your word would accomplish the purposes for which you send it forth and not return empty or void. And so, Lord, we pray that we would hear it and that it would penetrate and, and uh, take root in our own hearts and that, Lord, we may bear fruit upon hearing it and, and, um, and love, loving you and loving our neighbor. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Joseph, you recall, has been putting his brothers uh, to the test. They returned to Egypt with Benjamin 
and uh, they were received uh, very uh, well with hospitality and uh, were brought into the house of Joseph and uh, enjoyed a feast with Joseph, made merry with Joseph, and uh, had a great old time uh, with him. And, uh, and then Joseph instructed uh, his, uh, his number one servant, his, the, the house steward, to place not only all the money that the brothers brought back in the bags, but to place his own silver cup in the bag of Benjamin. And he did this to test the brothers. He knew exactly what he was doing. He did this to test them, and it's, part it's particularly a test. How much do they love their brothers now? When they threw me in the pit, there was no love. How much do they love their brother, Benjamin, now? See, that's the, that's the test that he's putting his brothers through. And, uh, of course, the cup was found in Benjamin's sack of grain. And uh, they returned to Joseph's house. Joseph asked them, what have you done? And uh, they answer, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. And so there's, a, ah, there's, there's an evidence of the Spirit moving in their hearts, recognizing their own guilt in, not in stealing the, the cup. They saw something bigger was happening here and that God was bringing them to account finally for their sin against Joseph 22 years ago. And Judah says, we'll stay, I'll stay here as your servants. And then Joseph says, no, just Benjamin. The rest of you can go home. And that's where we come in here. And Judah gives his great speech. When I was in seventh and eighth grade, I was, we were in a Christian school, and uh, we had speech class. Um, Debbie can verify it because she was in that class. We've known each other that long. Um, <laughs> and uh, we were uh, given these assignments uh, to uh, give a speech. And each student in the class had to come in front of the class and give different speeches, uh, which was, uh, as I look back on that thing, it was a, that was a very good, uh, uh, you know, good practice uh, for us. And uh, so over those couple of years, seventh and eighth grade, we were required to give multiple speeches in front of the class um, about different topics, um, your favorite food, you know, something like that, or you had to read a poem or something, just coming in front of class and just publicly speaking and learning to do that. And, uh, and certainly, as we all know, people who can do that well, they're recognized as such. They're, they're recognized as uh, good orators, good speakers, and uh, th and that that ha that carries that carries weight among the human race. If you are able to speak well, that 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 carries uh, weight. And so, uh, people who are able to do that are known, like Socrates. He was a known orator. Uh, or Chrysostom uh, was a great preacher in the early church and known for it for that or you know Charles Spurgeon was known to be a very good orator a good speaker and a good preacher general uh, Douglas MacArthur uh, was known for that and we could list many many names of people who uh, were known to be good public speakers many others well here we have Judah giving a speech I don't think Judah was a known public speaker but this speech he gives was uh, a very powerful one, um, a very moving speech that is recorded for us in Scripture. It is also the, um, the longest speech in the book of Genesis. And so, you know, why? Why is that the case? And I think it's because, uh, you know, the Lord wants to impress on us that um, this is important. 
What he's saying here is very important. And, uh, and it's good for us to, to look at that and to think about it. Um, he's speaking primarily on behalf of his younger brother, but also for his father. And at the end, he's willing to give his life for Benjamin. He's willing to substitute. Instead of Benjamin staying with you, Almighty Governor, let him go home and I'll stay with you and be your servant. That's what he's willing to do. That's what he, he appeals to Joseph to do. And what I want us to see is that this is what true love looks like. This is what true love looks like. There's no greater love but the one who lays down his life for his friend, or for his brother. And this is a love that Judah is expressing for his father Jacob and for his brother Benjamin. And it teaches us, doesn't it, that true love isn't easy. It's not just, uh, you know, the butterfly feelings inside, you know, or the, the nice little emotions that we have. And, and, and I don't mean to treat that lightly. Those are wonderful things, and they're blessings from God um, that we have those butterfly times and, and the emotions are, are, are such. But um, that's not what defines true love. And... Uh, and, and what we have in, in Judah here, what Judah is, is expressing is really what it is. It's a, it's a willingness to give of yourself. That's not easy. <laughs> it, it, it's a sacrificing of something for the object of your love, for, this, for the one whom you love. Um, it's giving what is hard to give. It's giving what is hard to give. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So it's, a, it's a, the sacrificing of that which is dear to you. And that's what we see here. And so it's, a, it's powerful, I think, this, this speech, this, this latter half of chapter 44 in the book of Genesis, the longest speech that we have recorded for us in Genesis is very instructive for us. And what makes it all the more powerful, I think, is that 22 years ago, it was this very Judah who said, let's sell Joseph and make some profit. If we kill him, we, don't, we get nothing. But we have these traitors coming down the road. Let's, let's sell them to them and we can go, come home with a bit of cash. And so, uh, you know, that, that's the Judah 22 years ago. No love there. Uh, he wanted to profit from selling Joseph. He was selfish. He was unloving. And I think that background is, is, is all the more, makes this speech all the more impressive and powerful and compelling. Because we see that something has happened in those 22 years Joseph, uh, Judah is a transformed man. He's a transformed man. So what I want to do is look through this speech together with you. Um, just looking at the flow of the speech, I think that uh, it's just helpful. To, we'll walk, walk through it together. Um, but then what I want to do is, is compare it to a couple of other uh, points in Scripture and then um, and show that this is... Um, what it means to be transformed in this way. And so that's where I want to go with this. But first, let's just look at the flow of the speech together. And you have in verse 18 then, sort of just the introduction. You know, Judah went up to him. Uh, and, and you see Judah's submission, you know, before this governor uh, of Egypt. And he, he steps out of the circle of the brothers and approaches Joseph, and he does so in a very submissive way. Um, you'll note throughout the speech, 
throughout from verse 18 all the way to the end of the chapter, he never uses his own name. It's always your servant. Your servant. Um, he's not putting himself out there. It's not like, it's not like look at me, I'm going to be taking charge here. That's not what, what's happening here at, at, by any means. You know, it's kind of, it reminds you kind of like the, uh, the disciple John when he writes his gospel, uh, the, the, the fourth book in the New Testament. And in there, he never uses his own name. Who is he? The disciple whom Jesus loved. He never uses his own name. It's, it's self-deprecating. It's not about me. And in the same way, you have that with, with Judah here. He never uses his own name. And, and, and he, he very politely asks permission to speak. He calls himself your servant. Calls Joseph my Lord. That's not in any way like deity kind of a, 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 a title for, for Joseph. That's not what he was thinking. It's, it was a title of respect. It was a title of recognizing his position as governor of the land and, uh, and his own position as a nobody. And so he says, I'm your servant. Oh, my Lord, hear me. Hear what I have to say. Don't be angry. I know you're, you're equal to, to Pharaoh, but don't be angry with me as, as I now speak. In other words, he's saying, I know... <laughs> You could put me to death. You could, you could send me to the gallows. I, I know you can do that. But hear me. Don't be angry with me as I speak. And there's, you know, there's, I think even here, there's a lesson for us to, to acknowledge those in positions of authority and to sh give them due honor and, and due respect. Um, why should we do that? Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And uh, I think that we do well to recognize that w when we are under authority, that we recognize that and we are polite <laughs> and and submissive. Uh, that's what we are called to be. And uh, so uh, there you have verse 18. Then you go on, and, and what he does from verses 19 to 23 is he, he reminds Joseph of past conversations. And so that's just what he's doing in those verses. You know, when you read through this, sometimes it's hard to, you know, when he's saying, my servant here and my Lord here and, and your servants and these kind of things and all of this is being said and it's kind of, sometimes it's a little hard to follow. But really what he's doing here is he's just simply reminding the governor, Joseph, of past conversations. You asked us if we had a father and any other brothers. And, and so we answered you and we told you, yes, we have an old man. Our father is an old man and and we have a brother, our youngest, uh, and uh, he is well loved by our father. And um, his brothers died, you know. So he's talking about Benjamin, and he's talking about Joseph uh, to Joseph, <laughs> and uh, and then he says, and 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 you told us to go back to Canaan and bring back our brother, and we told you that we couldn't. <laughs> that our father wouldn't, wouldn't let him go. You know, we, so he's going through all of this, reminding them of everything, and then he says, but you told us that unless we bring him to you, that we would not see your face again. And so in those verses, he's just simply reminding Joseph of the conversations he had. But then when we get to verse 24, he, he's telling Joseph information that Joseph doesn't have. He says, we returned, and this is what happened back in Canaan. And so that's what he's, he's saying in verses 24 to, to uh, 29, where, you know, it's, a, it's the reaction of Jacob and the struggle they had. Um, new information for Joseph. You know, when we returned, we told our father what you said. And, uh, 
And he pretty much told us he's not going to let Benjamin go. He's not going to lose another son. And, uh, and then our father told us that we needed to go back because our, our grain was running low and, you know, we, we needed food. And we told him, we can't go back, not without Benjamin. Not without Benjamin, we're, we're not going to go. We're not going to return because the man, the, the Lord of the land, told us that we wouldn't see his face. Uh, and so it would be useless for us to go back. And then your servant, our father, so you, Jacob, said, if we take Benjamin and something happens to him, quote, you will bring down my gray hairs in, in evil to Sheol. You will bring down my gray hairs in evil to Sheol. I won't go, I won't die in peace. I won't go to the grave with joy in my heart. It'll be sorrow and evil. And as Judah's telling Joseph this, he's, you notice he's not, he's not twisting the narrative. In other words, he is saying exactly what we saw earlier <laughs> that happened. Um, he's not, he's not, Twisting the narrative, and you think how easy, or at least how tempting it might have been in that situation to, to, to try to twist things, to try to get out from under this problem we have, um, and, and, and try to make them seem better than everything else. He, jo, Judah is not twisting the narrative at all. He isn't manipulating things. He's giving a very truthful and accurate and faithful account of what occurred. He's not lying, which again is always, I think, a good practice when we find ourselves in a pinch. We, the temptation is to try to lie, to try to somehow, you know, weasel our way out of it. But uh, uh, the, the best practice is uh, to be open. And this is the truth. This is, this is what happened. That's exactly what Judah is doing here in this passage. And then verse 30 and 31, he said, of course, it lays out, this is where we're at. Um, this is the dilemma. You know, and we're in a dilemma. Because you're saying that Benjamin needs to stay and the rest of us can go. But if we go back to Jacob without Benjamin, he's going to die. That's our dilemma. So he just laid it right out there. We're between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> There's no good answer here. Except maybe this. Verses 32 to 34. And he informs Joseph, J Judah does, that he had pledged to Jacob that Benjamin would return, or else he, Judah, would bear the blame. That he would bear the blame, that he would take responsibility, that he would be a pledge or a surety for Benjamin. So he, he's telling Joseph that that's what he had said to his father. And now he says, and so... Joseph, or governor, take me as your servant. Take me. And let the lad go with his brothers back to his father. Take me. I'll take his place. I'll be a substitute. This is the picture of Judah's love for, well, for Jacob. Jacob. His father, he says, I, I don't want to go back and see my father die in sorrow. I, that, that will break my heart. I can't do that. And I don't want to leave my brother in captivity. So he's, he's, it's a picture of his love for Jacob and also for Benjamin. 
I said at the beginning when, jo when Joseph put the, that silver cup in Benjamin's sack, uh, he was testing his brothers. He wanted to see what, what they're like today. How have they changed? And after this speech of Judah, whatever Joseph had been hoping for, I don't think it could have been better than this. <laughs> I don't think it could have been better than this. Whatever he was hoping for, I don't think it could have beat what Judah did here. Judah didn't say, you know, well, the cup was found in his sack, I guess, you know, you know, and, and throw Benjamin under the bus. That, that isn't what Judah did. Judah didn't try to lie or weasel himself out of it, which Joseph would have recognized. He just truthfully laid it out there and said, take me instead and let the lad go home. And now Joseph sees that the hateful, evil, wicked brothers of 22 years ago have changed. They're not the same men. And I think that's what this passage just wants to drive home to us. And that's why God gave this real estate in this book of Genesis for this longest speech in Genesis. That we see there's a changed heart. You know, there's a couple other um, appeals in Scripture I want to bring out. Uh, and and, and I, I must uh, confess that I got this idea from... Um, the commentary of James Montgomery Boyce on Genesis. Um, and, but I, in reading it myself, I was greatly blessed by it, and I thought it was very helpful. And so uh, I want to bring this out to you as well. In Exodus chapter 32, this is the, the scene where Moses is coming down Sinai with the, with the tablets of, of the law, and he hears the crowd noise. And he recognizes this isn't because of war. This is like jubilation and celebration. What's going on down there? And then discovers that they had made a golden calf and that they were reveling in all of this around this golden calf. And that's, that's in Genesis chapter 32. And um, Moses comes down, of course. He's very angry and had the tribe of Levi kill all of those who led this rebellion. And we're told in that passage about 3,000 men died. And, uh, and then in verses 31 and 32, we read this. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if, if, if you will forgive their, their sin... But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Hear that, what Moses says. These people have sinned, and it's a great sin. Oh, please forgive them, O oh Lord, but if not, then take me. Blot out my name from your book. Moses was willing to be a substitute for the people. Or note this, in Romans chapter 9, Paul is writing, and he's discussing the, the Jews, his, his kinsmen according to the flesh. His, you know, he's a, he himself is a Jew, and their unbelief and their destiny, and he's talking about that. And, you know, Paul himself, of course, was a Jew, and he was of the tribe of Benjamin, interestingly, um, highly educated, um, proud of his heritage. And he says this in Romans 9, verse 2 and following, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They're Israelites. And to them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, 
who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. And so here, Paul is, is thinking about you know, his fellow Jews and who have not turned to Christ. And he's saying, if, if, if there was some way I could be a curse so that they could know Christ and believe, I'm willing to do that. And so what you have here in, in, with Judah and with Moses and then with Paul is all of these are appeals to be substitute for another. Judah was willing to be a slave so that Benjamin could be freed. Moses was willing to have his name blotted out of God's book for the forgiveness and the life of the Israelites. Paul was willing to be accursed and cut off from Christ for the salvation of his kinsmen. How did that happen? How does that come about to have that kind of love? I think there's only one answer to that, and that is they have this, they've, been, they've been raised to newness of life, and they have the Spirit of Christ in their hearts. That's the only answer. They have the Spirit of Christ, Jesus, and they've been born again. <laughs> and the inevitable result of that is showing the character of Christ and the love of Christ. And, and that's what we see already way back in the Old Testament with Judah and with Moses and then in the New with, with Paul. Judah's a picture of, of Christ here. And all of these three, Judah and Moses and Paul, as, as they are making these offers probably hoped they wouldn't have to go through with it. <laughs> I would imagine, even though Judah was saying, take me, in the back of his mind he's saying, oh, I hope this, this governor is merciful. <laughs> you know, hoping that he wouldn't have to. Um, and here's the thing, none of them did. None of them had to go through with it. Judah didn't stay in Egypt to be a slave. Moses' name was not blotted out of the book of life. And Paul was not accursed and separated from Christ. None of them had to go through that. But Christ did. You know, he came, as we've been celebrating over these last few weeks, the incarnation of Christ. He came to earth to be our substitute, to take our place. And what these other three were willing to do, an amaz amazing wonderful love Christ did he set his glory aside the that glory of dwelling in in heaven with the father that he had enjoyed for all eternity he set that glory aside of his of his deity that, that I'm not saying he set his deity aside he set the glory of it aside and became obedient even unto death, for you and me. He came knowing. Here's the thing. He came, he came to earth knowing that he would have to pay the full price for our redemption. You think about that. That is love. He didn't just make the appeal to do it. He came and did it. He knew he had to do it, and he came for that purpose. He came knowing that he would die for us. And that God would lay on him the iniquity of us all. He knew that well ahead of time. That he who knew no sin would become sin for us. And that he would become a curse for us. And forsaken of the Father for us. He knew that. 
and that cup of suffering was not removed from him. And so, when we read this passage in Genesis 44, such a beautiful passage, see Christ there and what Christ did for us. He actually gave himself for us in reality. You, dear brothers and sisters, have been saved because of such great love from our Lord Jesus. I have been saved because of that great love of our Lord Jesus. And so, you know, wow, <laughs> this is this wonderful news that our Lord took our place and we should rejoice and be thankful. And do you have that same spirit of Christ? Do you love? That's, our, that's what we're called to, to love God and to love one another. In this way, sacrificially giving of ourselves, our Lord gave of himself for us. Praise be to God. Well, let's celebrate that as we come to the table together.